I feel what I am is not so much defined by my blood uh, or my religion, but by my culture. Well, that's our, the essence of what we are, isn't it? In my country or in that part of Europe I come from, so often the reality becomes so dramatic that you think theater is happening in the streets. And yet, theater thrives, actually, in times of such crisis, um, even in places like concentration camps, even in Auschwitz. I want heaven here on earth while I'm alive. Why should I not have it? And with God's blessing, Grant me, O oh Lord, some change, some liberty. Grant me at least a new servitude. after the revolution when, when the country was in civil war and people were eating dogs and cats um, and they sat in theaters in sheepskins and the air was frozen and, um, and the Moscow Art Theater performed for them uh, plays by Bulgakov um, and people felt that that was what they needed as much as food and electricity and heat. will definitely come through this period of crisis. But it may jeopardize the future of this theater. I have been all my life, all my professional life, a theater director, a freelance theater director. This has been the first year of my uh, running a theatre and being the artistic director of Theatre Cloyd, which is the biggest adventure in my life. Very exciting and one which now occupies all my thoughts. The crisis, um, that is really what is damaging. People just thinking how to quickly save and cutting productions and cutting stuff. One of the challenges and highlights of this season was to be my long dreamt of production adaptation of Bulgakov's Master and Margarita. We were all set, but because it was at a time of cuts and savings and financial difficulties, this was the first production that had to be cut from my program. Um, Smashing. Right, let's then get going. Um, the pressure was to simply not do anything in one slot, thus saving the amount of money that Master and Margarita would have cost. I decided to keep those theatres open by reviving Jane Eyre in the main house. Jane Eyre was our greatest success last season. Mr. Brocklehurst, there was porridge for breakfast, so badly prepared the girls could not swallow it. I took the liberty of serving an extra lunch of bread and cheese. The girls are not to be accustomed to habits of luxury and indulgence, but rendered hardy, patient, self-denying. When you put bread and cheese instead of burnt pottage into these children's mouths, you may indeed feed their vile bodies, but you think but think how you starve their immortal souls. Miss Ab. What is her full name? Jane Ayrson. She is but recently come. She's a good, quiet girl. Oh, good girls are good, quiet girls. No, there is something else. I will remember presently. Who is that girl over there? She is untitled. It is Helen Burns. She will never get to heaven if she continues to be a slatter. What? I feel very strongly Polish. I come from Poland. I was brought up in Poland and I arrived in this country at the age of 24. In Central Europe, there isn't an existence that hasn't been either crushed by history or somehow uh, affected by the developments. 
either the wars or the revolutions and so on. There isn't anybody whose China hasn't been smashed by tanks at some point of their lives. So we learn to look at reality as a combination of individual destiny and history. And that is something that very f strongly informs my perception of what life is about and certainly what the art's role is in life. In the morning, Miss Temple went to see how Helen was and found Jane Eyre lying asleep beside her in the bed. Helen herself was dead. The whole Theatre Cluid complex has a turnover of about four million pounds. Uh, we get one and a half million from Cluid County Council, half a million from the Welsh Arts Council, a million from box office and a million from other earned income. The County Council is likely to suffer further restrictions from central government next year and we could be looking at a further 5% cut from the County Council. Added to that, the planning figure from the Welsh Arts Council for next year is a cut of 2%. So if we put those two figures together, we could be looking at a further cut overall of up to 10% next year in our public funding, which would be catastrophic for Theatre Tluid. speaking in my head. Was it the voice or the wind that whistles through the doors of the cove? I am the queen of the high mountain, bride am I of the beauteous one. I lie upon the bed of exaltation, eternal is my desire, unendingly am I with child. <laughs> In the studio, we are presenting world premiere of an English language uh, new adaptation of Caradoc Pritchard's novel, The Full Moon. I would never have attempted The Full Moon without there being John Owen, who is the co-writer of the adaptation, and my co-director. We shall together try to, to, uh, uh, to look at it from the two... Uh, standpoints and that's the interesting thing the uh, the, well the, the looking at it and hoping that the, 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 those two will create something yeah. though I I expect conflicts and um, clashes and interesting. it has been uh, the most excruciating three months of my life <laughs> in trying to get a form that would lend itself and be made accessible to non-Welsh speaking people and English people because as you know Theatre Tluid appeals to about 60% of its audiences from across the border and it must stand in its own right as a piece of theatre and as a piece of literature. Um, it, it's been like putting um, a chain through the eye of a needle very very hard. May I do this? This will be at their expense. <laughs> <laughs> so what they say is that it all right? <laughs> I don't know what they say in Welsh, but in uh, the language of my forefathers, they say Mazel Tov. <laughs> I'm sorry, but without it, I wouldn't feel that we could truly launch this ship. <laughs> Jesus, what time is it, boys? It's half past nine by the clock on the locker. Will you get a good idea? No, not unless I don't get up to go to the... No, not unless I don't get up to go to the quarry with Chloe tomorrow morning. Good night, boys. Good night, Moy. Good night, Moy. And that's all that happened. We weren't anywhere except walking about. And I didn't hear until this morning after I'd been to Ned Cobbler's hut to get a nail put in my shoe that Moy's Uncle Owen had hanged himself in the toilet. And that they'd taken little Jenny Penkai and Catherine Jones from Lower Lane to the asylum. There's a full moon tonight. Why won't you let Hugh come out to play, or Queen of the Black Lake, Lady of Hindi? The pressure on me was, from the board, was not to do a production at all in that slot, neither in the main house nor at the Emlyn Williams. 
So we brought Jane Eyre into the main house because that was already a production that was ready. And uh, the full moon, we had to come up with an adaptation very quickly because the money available to me for this slot were so minimal and that therefore it would be a very small scale production. I never thought that a time would come when I would have to direct two plays at the same time. Oh, there's a break in rehearsal because uh, we were about to start uh, a scene, but because Heller is often called away to, to do, well, we're really, she's often called away to deal with business, which you know, at critical moments, which for example now, so we wait. But I mean, she has to do it, so. The board of governors who um, a councillors, this is a council owned theatre, are now increasingly nervous over the expenditures here and have to justify the existence of this theatre at all. It's survival in the face of, of for instance, uh, cuts that need to be made in hospital beds and in um, help for the aged and in social services. Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome. Um, I'm sorry that we're a little late. Agenda item one. We invested heavily in productions over the last three years. It paid off because we substantially increased audiences and we've doubled our box office income in that time. But it's not been quite enough to cover the extra investment. So that when we had to sustain a 6% cut this financial year, the result is we've got an accumulated deficit of 200,000. The critical acclaim for India Song has been uh, quite remarkable. Just a quote uh, from The Guardian, it is an event of international significance which lifts this theatre into the world championship class. Anyone who has this board meeting is a result of their rejection of my plan at the last board meeting. I presented a program which could be achieved if they allowed us to distribute the debt over a period of two years, of two seasons. That was rejected. I then, with the help of my team, came up with an emergency program which is very dangerous for this theatre. It's, it is full of hazards. Uh, the program involves what amounts to closure of the Emlyn Williams Theatre, which is our experimental space, and to concentrate on the work in the main house. What happened at the board meeting? Oh, uh, that it was a very long show, which took perhaps three hours, and we didn't even cover half of the program. So there we are. Uh, we still survived. Is it going to survive? Well, of course it's going to survive. How could anybody imagine that it wouldn't survive? The form of its survival is, a, is something which we must you know, always be uncertain about, but be determined uh, to achieve that very survival in whatever form. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's a dangerous attitude to apply um, strictly business prerogatives to uh, a theatre which is aimed to exist not as a commercial theatre, but as a subsidised national theatre or, the or, or regional theatre of importance. What I feel is wrong with the prospect of a country being just um, dissected and having just a series of um, large visiting venues with the same product moving that will have a series of supermarkets with exactly the same product and whether you are in this amazing historical landscape with the hills which are historical burial um, grounds and battlefields or whether you are in walking um, you always get the same Tesco's you know I feel that that contradicts the idea of identity, of cultural profile, of a sense that people are different and that's why they are brothers and sisters. Because they are different, not because they are clones. Oh no, what's the best way? TV Jones and Keeper might be a long way yet. Oh, we'll build it. I'm just gonna caught on some slate and ripped as he fell on his bum in the net. Yeah, you gonna pay me? Oh, make a noise in case Jones the Keeper catches us. So, that gives us just that all that must be 
really very quiet. Uh, Danny, and we aim to open the door with the first sound of the music. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday we built the set. We started at 8 o'clock in the morning and we finished at 1 o'clock this morning. Um, and then 9 o'clock this morning the cast arrived to put on their costumes and we're working through the piece from the very beginning to the very end and we've got till 11 o'clock tonight to do the whole thing. You shut up and eat. Come on, out as fast as you can. Have we better go and fetch a little more police from the spot? No, 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 12, 14 hour days as an, as, an, as an everyday occurrence and six, seven day weeks, seven day weeks are not uncommon. What is she writing? What shall I know? I have to admit to being a theatre socialist. <laughs> I believe that it's that theatre is something that, that is to do with quality of life. It isn't an elitist art form that only the rich should be able to afford. So I do believe that subsidies should be available for it. I grew up in Manchester when there were no theatres open. They were all shut. The only way I could get to see theatre productions was to go to London. I couldn't afford it. I was from a working class family who had no access to that. And I basically said I would work in the theatre and would ensure that other people weren't put through that same problem, that they could have access to theatre in their own hometown. The fact that money's being cut back, I think it's, it's a government policy that that theatre isn't an essential part of life, that it's something that is a, is a little frippery, it's an accessory, and it can be taken away without much damage. I don't agree with that. I think one would have to ask a lot of the audience what they would say, you know, about that, because it's their money. What do you think of theatre clearance? Very good. Yeah. How frequently do you go there? Um, probably once a month. Yeah. As often as that? Yeah. How would you feel if it closed down? Uh, very disappointing. You'd say once every two months, something like that. I mean, I'd like to go more often, but um, don't usually have any spare cash. <laughs> but I, I, no, I think it's very good. How important is it to the local community? I think it's very important because it, you know, it brings in famous people and it brings in custom and things like that. Uh, I think we're very lucky to have somewhere like that on our doorstep. You go there? Yes, regularly. You realise that it's under a lot of pressure yes. from cutbacks. How does that make you feel? It uh, makes me very cross, very angry. What sort of gap would it leave, if any, if the theatre closed? Oh, tremendous gap. I mean, there's, there's nothing else. And my daughter dances there as well, so that virtually axes her career. should feel they can call upon us any time. If they want a course in the arts, if they want training in the arts, if they want a, a juggler to go into school and do something, if they want a writer to help them write a play, if they want to go to an adult theatre workshop, children's theatre workshop, dance classes, talk with an expert about a text, anything in the arts, we hope we can deliver it. If we can't, we'll put them in touch with somebody who can. Youth Theatre began, uh, I think it's 23 years ago now. It's an exciting uh, area of theatre because we can have huge numbers of young people involved and we can take risks that perhaps sometimes the professional theatre companies can't. All ready to go in, I know. Immediately they came, we could see the problem. Are your arms getting knackered? Right. Um, it's essential, I think, for young people to take part in the arts. It's, it's how they make sense of their world. They naturally experiment with the arts from being tiny, tiny babes. It isn't just play. It isn't. It's making sense of how they relate to other people, how they relate to circumstances, how they understand issues, how they relate to adults. 
They explore the world through the arts. I went yesterday to see a performance of Julius Caesar, a touring production of the RSC in a sports center for many of those people their first theater experience and to see those enthralled faces young faces watching the soldiers brushing past them and the uh, the incomparable unrepeatable combination of uh, sound live performance music light and a an actor living and committing himself fully there dying in front of them is something that those children that watched it and the older people will never forget and it will always transcend what they can see on a small screen. Make it still playful. Yeah. Helen, how's it going? Yeah. The tech, the tech, oh, it's very slow but quite good for this very, very complex production. <laughs> Two productions at this point? Yes, yes, part of me, somewhere else. <laughs> no, I, I enjoy it. He will take care of that, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure he's quite relieved I'm not sitting on his shoulder. <laughs> Wonderful row we had. I told her you brought English middle class values to bear in this theatre, and I abhor it. But she's forgiven me for that. The vision is greater than a narrow look at Wales, and the vision is something that we need desperately. And uh, I would support her totally in that. Gentlemen, I can go down around the piano and go through that hymn. As a freelance director, I have been planting a little tree in other people's gardens. And by coming here, I suddenly got seduced by the idea of planting an orchard and wondering what sort of trees they should be, how they should fit, fit the soil of this particular landscape, and yet how their crowns should extend far and high into the sky, which encompasses Britain and Europe. So it's just a, a bonnet and apron change where we've stopped. Oh, one, two, one, two, one, two, two, two. But it's quite good because I just have to look like I'm dead, you see. That's Tabby, so it's the walking dead. So I look like that. I'm happy dog. Like that. But when I'm Betty, I look like that. And when I'm Hannah, I look like that, because she's a happy maid. And when I'm Grace Poole, I look like this. Because she's strange. <laughs> But are you a happy maid when you're thinking about what's happening to the theatre? Oh no, I'm a very unhappy maid then. <laughs> <laughs> the craft of acting, you only learn about the craft of acting on the stage, nowhere else. Come, come, the sides, Mom. He's only for people. I mean, you, you obviously interrupted me now because um, of Jane Eyre, and I'm going to go on in a minute. All my head and my body is full of Jane Eyre. I can't it's not easy for an actor, I don't think, to divorce himself from one thing to another. Um, it's our first night tonight, so therefore those nerves. But this, that is what that training is about. It makes you, it toughens you up. It makes you professional about your attitude. And if these places are going to go, then where else are the young people, where are they going to go to? <laughs> I mean, I've been an actor 
just for 30 years. You work in places like Holland, as I have, and each, each city has as much money as the whole of the Arts Councils of Great Britain. I think the biggest problem that they face, like every other theatre in the country, is a very stingy attitude to the arts. Uh, from the top, from the government. Um, when uh, when we've got a government that can spend, uh, that can overspend more on putting a bunker underneath the Ministry of Defence than it does on the entire Arts Council budget, it seems to me the priorities have got to rise somehow. that owns and operates Theatre Clearing is likely to disappear within 18 months under local government reorganisation in Wales. The reorganisation of, of local government in, in North Wales means that instead of being funded by one large county authority, the theatre in future is going to have to go around with a begging bowl to a number of smaller authorities who um, uh, quite predictably will fall out and start saying, well, we're not contributing to that. And that seems to me to be a terrible shame. It means that the, the theatre management are putting effort into uh, politicking and finance that ought to be going on to what's happening on stage. I'm beginning to feel desperate about the whole situation. The problems that Theatre Cluid faces in detail are unique, but the general climate in which theatres are now operating um, has instilled a sense of desperation throughout the whole industry. And it really is an industry. A lot of people's jobs depend on it. We've been here how many years? 18. Here and then about 25, 24, 25. And all. they have to have decide jobs were secure. And then a couple of days later, commercial services said they were having to cut back. And they were only going to have two cleaners here, three at the most. So 
in the meantime, everybody in the county had these letters offering early retirement or redundancy. So four of us have opted for that because we haven't got that long left to work. So we're finishing at the end of the financial year. There is a policy here of no compulsory redundancies, isn't there? Yes. yes. Yeah. But the jobs weren't there, so you really don't have a choice, do you? I'd like to work in here for 18 years. I'm nothing. Place to work. We've really enjoyed it. Well, you know, we're sorry to go. Yes, a little bit sometimes. Me too. Oh, don't worry. He can't do anything with that trunk on his back. First sack's not bad after three weeks. So we've got one week left to do Act 2. No, that's not quite. Truthfully, it's, we, we've touched Act 2, but um, we spent a great deal of time trying to evolve, um, I can't think of the English word. Um, um, I can't think of the English word. Give us it in Welsh. Um, <laughs> Arrill. Arrill. Um, a stein. A stein. And, and, and uh, that's taken uh, a great deal of time. And um, we finally got that, yes. He's going to have a fit. <laughs> Go on, Ryan. You can't get up. Will my benighted day disturb my sleep with a deep laughter? And then... I feel the process is so exciting that I don't think anything is wasted, you see. And that is my feeling about the whole crisis. I feel that it's terrible that things should be, that one should work under pressure rather than be given all the conditions and all the support and all the encouragement that art needs, rather than continually being pressed to, like a shopkeeper, to come up with how much cash have you got and how do your books meet. in my life. Um, it's, it's the end of the dress rehearsal and we're within a, an hour and a half of the first performance. So it's, um, we're scared. It is the company which is the heart, the real heart of this big building. And if that heart stops, everything else will stop. It will then be a multi-purpose leisure center. Two languages in Wales, the dragon has two tongues. 
there's one culture. And if they go from there feeling a great sense of pride and an emotive love of their country and their language, this would be a good night. They're going to put her away, aren't they? Denby! Asylum! Oh, and the ghost brother, Anne, in his coffin, with his mouth open. Asylum! Now, this is me, my lad. It's a hard time for everyone. But we must bow to the will of Providence and make the best of things as they are. We don't do I feel that cultural deprivation, the kind of cultural desert that can be created in people's minds and people's hearts by um, irresponsible policies, irresponsible attitude to the importance of culture in people's lives is more dangerous than troops with arms and, and gas in the streets. Just go and see the doctor. Everything will be all right. Here you are. You can take these home with you. Your mother's clothes and the rain. Did the young mum's clothes in such a small bath? <laughs> Crying. But not like when I'd fallen over and hurt myself. Or like when I was at some funeral. <clears throat> I was crying. <laughs> like I was throwing up. <clears throat> see me crying like it was the end of the world transferring to London so we are here rehearsing rehearsing it's it's about to open in the meanwhile Paul Morn is enjoying a, a, a very, very good success with the public and the press. And at the same time, we are facing almost a complete cut to our next year budget. We've got a knife on our throat. Either we come up with a program which is impossible, uh, or we're closed. The company closes. <laughs>